I am continuing today our series on life's greatest lessons. And this is, of course, focused on the Sermon on the Mount. It is said that this is the best-known sermon of all time, the most beloved, uh, the one, uh, the best known of Jesus' teachings. Um, and so I want to know more about the Sermon on the Mount. How about you? And not only to know about it, because we can study things, but I want to apply, apply the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we've talked about so many things, starting out with the Beatitudes, but now we find that Jesus is focusing uh, on uh, numerous things in chapter 6 of, of Matthew's gospel. But I want to focus in on where he looks at treasure. So get ready for that. I remember when I was a boy, uh, my brother and I used to go to Disneyland. We lived out in Southern California, and my mom used to get free ticket, admission tickets to Disneyland. And one of my favorite rides was Pirates of the Caribbean or Caribbean, however you want to say it. And I remember the yo-ho, yo-ho. You know what I'm talking about. You'd go through. It was always on a hot day, a cool ride to be able to go into. And we would look at the pirates that looked so real. And those pirates had treasure. And I still remember as a boy looking at the gold and thinking, you know, oh, I'd love to jump over into that. I think they updated it to a Johnny Depp version now. But I just remember as a boy... You know, looking at all that gold, all that treasure, and being so inspired to say to my brother, it's time we bury some treasure, like the pirates. So we did. In our backyard in Hermosa Beach, California, we grabbed some of, I, I think, my mom's jewelry, or, and we buried treasure there and, uh, in the backyard. It could probably still be dug up, you know, if we could go back. Um, but as we get ready to read Jesus' words... I want you to consider the fact that the majority of the people Jesus was speaking to were poor. Uh, when you uh, would hear a message in that day uh, there where Jesus was speaking, if we bring it back to its original context, we're going to realize that for people listening, uh, their security would be in their wealth. Uh, their wealth would be seen in the clothes that they would wear and their possessions and where they, uh, you know, what they would live in and these type of things. And so as Jesus addresses the issues to the original audience, uh, we take it all the way to the year 2019 to see where this applies to us, what God is saying. 15% um, of everything Jesus said uh, was focused on this very subject of treasure and resources. So it's something I think that at times pastors can neglect speaking to because they know it can be misinterpreted and people can, you know, say, oh, you're talking about money and these type of things. But, but Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount on treasure. So I want to look at that and then we'll look at another subject he spoke on as well. Let's read in Matthew 6, starting in the 19th verse. The Bible says, and these are Jesus' words, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves uh, break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in where? Heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. And boy, I could go into a description of the cornea and the working of the eyeball. I can tell you it is by light that you see. Jesus is using this as, a, as an analogy here. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, uh, your whole body will uh, be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So let's look at this and get a sense for what uh, Jesus is speaking here. And of course, again, we've already looked at the original audience we know that this is a topic that Jesus did speak on often. 
Uh, Jesus addresses three key issues here that I want us to look at. One is he addresses where you store your treasure, okay? There's a story, it's a fictional story, but it gets the thought across. A man was walking along the beach, and as he was walking along the beach, he happened to notice that there was a lamp. Uh, he picked it up, and as he was looking at it and rubbing the sand away, it was a magic lamp, the genie comes out. The genie says, uh, what is it that you wish, and I will grant it. And I wonder, what would we feel? If we had one wish that we could have come true, what would it be? This man in this fictional story begins to think on it. He says, I've got it. I know what I want. And the genie says, what is it? I'll grant the wish. He said, I want the stock market page for the local paper one year from now. The genie disappears. And immediately appearing before the man is the stock market page for one year to the date of the local paper in the future. And the man can't believe his good fortune. He's looking at this. He's thinking, wow, what I can do with this. I'm going to make a mint uh, through it. And he's very excited. And then he flips the paper over, and he notices something he hadn't planned on seeing. And it's the flip side of it is, are the obituaries. And at the top of the page is his name. <laughs> and immediately you can imagine the paradigm shift. That when he thought his focus was on money, when he saw the ob obituaries, he realized that what mattered most was not what he thought what mattered most. And I think it's a good story for us to consider as we think through where you store your treasure. It's so important that we understand that Jesus spoke of things eternal and also things in the, nat in the natural. And he said that we must place our focus as far as our treasure and the value of the treasure on the eternal side and not on the natural side. And so we see in this uh, story this idea. Now, I read once of a challenge that was delivered by somebody uh, to believers in Jesus Christ, and that was to consider your, uh, where you spend your money, where you give your money over the next two weeks. And look at that when you're done with it over a two-week period and look to see how much was invested in what is eternal versus how much was invested in things that are not eternal. Second thing Jesus spoke to is how you and I would view treasure. Uh, I remember, um, and I don't know why I go with the Disney analogies today, but uh, the movie Nemo. I remember that all of the seagulls, I don't know if it was a little crab or what it was, but uh, all the seagulls were wanting it, and they were all saying, mine, 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 mine. Remember that scene? Mine, mine, mine. And that's an analogy of where we can go with things in regard to our resources. Do we see it as mine, 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 must get more, must have more, uh, must hoard more, or do we recognize that that can actually bind us up, that that can get us to a place where our focus is not on the things that Jesus is drawing our focus to, but instead it's focused on greed and want and what we have and the American dream, which, which is a Western culture dream. And so Jesus is wanting to liberate us. And it's a matter of trust, isn't it? That if we trust in God, then we can know that what we invest in the kingdom will never be such that we lost something, but instead we invested something. And I believe that the parable of the talents speaks to investment, or uh, in some translations, it's known as the parable of the gold bags. But the whole idea, and we know we speak to it often, but the whole idea is that what is given to those servants by the master didn't belong to the servants. It was on loan to the servants. It belonged to the master. And the day would come when the master would come back. And the first two servants, uh, they had invested what was the master's resources, but the last one had buried it. And so Jesus speaks to this. That's in another gospel other than Matthew. But Jesus speaks to this on more than one occasion. And I believe that it's important that we gather up this concept that there is an eternal. 
And then there is a temporal. And one day we will have a measurement of our lives, not by what we did to attain in the natural, but what we did to invest in where we will live for all of eternity. And remember, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount is spoken in terms of a kingdom. It's all about the kingdom of God. And the one delivering the message is the king of kings. And we are his loyal subjects. And he's telling us how to live in a way whereby we live to receive the blessing of the king. And we live to be able to do the king's bidding and to have the focus be the priorities of the king, not of ourselves. And number three, we see, is one of the key things that Jesus uh, is speaking to, uh, is if we serve treasure. Larry Burkett, uh, who's the Christian finance expert, said these words. Christ said the greatest threat to Christianity is not drugs, sex, murder, rape, or even a politician. The greatest threat is materialism. Do you realize how many uh, messages come to us every single day of what we need to buy, purchase in order to feel like we are somebody? And so uh, if we live in this neighborhood, if we have this car, if we drive this, if we smell like this and we wear this, then we are successful. Jesus is countercultural and he is radical in what he's saying. Because he's, he's speaking a message, yes, to the original crowd. It is the same today. All of that is the counterfeit message. None of those things are going to last. You can't take it with you. And even the titles that you have and all those things that are so important, try and get it on a gravestone. A lot of the titles we have wouldn't even fit. It doesn't matter. What matters is the kingdom of God and the priorities of the king and that we're loyal to his bidding. Amen? Jesus addresses within this and what he's saying here in the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses the control that money has on people. Do you know that money can dictate to you where you live? Absolutely. Well, if this job pays more, I'm going to live here next to where I can be at that job, and it'll dictate where you live. It'll dictate so many things in our lives that we need to look at this message and say, Jesus, what are you teaching here? Bill Shuler isn't teaching it. I mean, I'm relating a teaching of Jesus, but Jesus is teaching this fundamental truth, so powerful a message, that what matters is eternity and not just what's on this earth. And if we will focus on eternity, all of a sudden our investment will be such that it's pleasing to the king. And so... The next thing that Jesus focuses on is worry, worry, anxiety. Let's look at this in Matthew 6, starting with the 25th verse. Jesus' words here, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any uh, any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he uh, not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, here it is, this great statement that many of us uh, memorize and share often wherever we go, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Each day has enough trouble of its own. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And by the way, that is specific to individuals in this room. Do not worry about tomorrow. You've been worrying about something that's been keeping you up at night. God wants you to know you can trust him. He's on the move. He's orchestrating things from behind the scenes. Amen? So, it's interesting. Again, let's talk context for a moment. As Jesus speaks about worry, he does it right after he talked about money, which is interesting, or treasure, because so many people find themselves worrying about that first and foremost. But worry can carry into a lot of different areas of life. You could be worried about your career. You could be worried about a relationship that you have with, uh, with a family member. You could be worried about a relationship you have with a friend. Uh, you could be worried about your bank account. It can go into a lot of different areas, this thing called anxiety or worry. Uh, so when you see the words uh, as we went into what I just read in the second portion of Scripture, therefore, we learned in seminary something, and that was whenever you see the word therefore, always look what it's there for. And so it's, it's a transition that links to something before it, but it's taking you somewhere, therefore. Um, so Jesus speaks in these terms, and he speaks of worry. This is the longest portion of the Sermon on the Mount, is focused on this concept of worry or anxiety. And if we look at, there's rolling thunder out there, um, but they don't thunder like the Word of God. Here we go. <laughs> The Greek word that we see with this word anxious or worry is actually two words. It's composed of two words. The first Greek word means to divide. And the second Greek word is, the meaning is the mind. So what we have with this is a divided mind when we allow ourselves to be taken away by what we have that we're anxious about or worry. A divided mind is going to be less effective for the kingdom. So Jesus, the king of kings, does, want, does not want us to be less effective for the kingdom because our mind is divided into the worry we have about the things happening in our lives versus the mandate on our lives to carry forward the kingdom message. We are to run this race in such a way as to win. We will stumble in the race, and we will pivot and not be moving towards the final line to break through and win if we find ourselves divided in regard to this where we have faith in God, but we have worry about the things we're facing in the world. You have a God that wants to be there large and in charge and on the scene when it comes to worry. When it comes to what you're facing, you are not alone. Those things may tie to finances, but they could tie to so many different things. You can't outgive God in giving your time into the kingdom. You can't. You think, I don't have any time, Pastor. Do you know Billy Graham was speaking with a United States senator uh, decades ago, and he approached him and said, I wanted to speak with you, Senator. And the senator said, I don't even have a minute of time to give you. I'm so busy. And he died before midnight. He thought he didn't have time, but he needed to take that time. And it's critical that we recognize that with all of these things that we could say, we don't have time, we don't have money, we don't have love to give anymore. I'm giving out. I've been hurt. I put up walls. But the reality is, is that with the things most precious to us, I want you to know they're precious to God. He can redeem and he can use those things as an investment into the kingdom. And we can be advancing the kingdom. Amen? And so between 20 to 30%, if we look at it in today's society, between 20 to 30% of all Americans today on this date, this Sunday, today, 15 or 20 to 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent of Americans will realize or experience significant stress. 13 million Americans will worry intensely for at least 90 minutes today. And I know if I'm speaking in these terms that that's true right here in this congregation and this group of people right now, that that is true as well, that we probably have about 20 to 30 percent of you 
will deal with anxiety that will take up a, a good hour and a half of your time today worrying about something. I think Jesus has a message not only for 2,000 years ago. I believe this message is to you today. Lindy Marshall, who was an office manager, is an office manager in New York City. Uh, she had a friend who coined a term, and that term became known after 9-11 in New York. And the term was wallpaper anxiety. It's always in the background. After 9-11, New Yorkers would feel this. It's always in the background whether you consciously notice it or not. And yet, psychologists will tell you something. Psychologists will tell you that 90% of what you worry about will never happen. Isn't that interesting? 90% of the things that we put so much of our energies in that age us prematurely, that keep us divided in our minds to where we can't be as effective for the kingdom of God, don't even happen according to psychologists. In other words, they would tell you today were they to stand here, psychologists, having studied this, that it's wasted time. And I believe that Jesus is intimating that worry is without purpose and that it's senseless. Mark Twain, Mark Twain said these words, I am an old man, and have, I have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. Isn't that interesting? St. Francis of Assisi, we see with his prayer, it's a prayer that many people have heard since they've been a child. Listen to this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's been needle-pointed. I don't know if that's a way to say it, doctor. Uh, <laughs> it's been put into needle-point. It's been written, stenciled. It's in books. It's everywhere. People quote it. But honestly, if you step back and you just study it for a little while, you say, this person had a great deal of wisdom with this prayer. God grant me the serenity, in other words, peace in the midst of anxiety, to accept the things I cannot change. And there are certain things in your past that you cannot change it. You can't go back in a time machine. And I used to love the movies that were about time machines. And you'd go back and there was a TV series, MacGyver, I think. You know, these things where you can go back and all of a sudden he's put in different time zones and able to do certain things. And maybe somebody showing up right before the assassination of Abraham Lincoln or whatever the cool concept was of those type of themes. You can't go back and change history in your family or life, but you'd be able to do something about it in the now. How you respond in the now, what you do to bring healing and hope in the now, that's something different. And some of you are carrying baggage of anxiety over things that have happened to you in your past. And I want you to be able to know that Jesus is wanting to speak to you right now to say you don't have to carry that anymore. I think that's a pretty wise thing. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And then courage to change the things I can. And I love that word courage being used there. Because I believe it is courageous to stand up in a PC generation and say, I stand for Jesus. I stand for the authority of the Bible. I stand for faith. In the midst of a generation that wants to tell you, be silent. Stay in the four walls of your church with that. It has no place in the public domain. Absolutely it has a place in the public domain. Jesus was crucified on a cross up on a hill where people had to see it. You look at what happened there as they put that sign above him. And they crucified him there. That was public. It wasn't private. We see the courage that is needed and oftentimes taken by individuals. Yet I remember that when I wrote, for two years, I wrote a weekly article for Fox News, and it would be on God or faith and values. I got to the point I wouldn't even read the responses to what I would write. At first, it was like, oh, cool, responses. <laughs> that lasted about one article. And there would be articles that I would write, and there'd be some 2,000-plus responses within 24 hours. I was curious, but not so curious as to be feeling what I would feel to read through those things. Do you know the majority of what would be written would be by trolls that would say, this guy who has this, you know, uh, idea that this fabricated God is somewhere out there. 
Oh, this is probably like one, uh, another one of those pastor preacher guys who takes little kids down to South America and then molests them. I would look to see the responses of the church of Jesus Christ in my day. And it was almost like crickets. Every now and then you'd have somebody say, this needs to be out there. This needs to be known. God is alive. The Bible is authoritative. We should love our spouses. We should love our kids. We should prioritize to things eternal. But I'm telling you that it takes courage to stand up nowadays. It takes courage in your own family. Sometimes that's the hardest place of all. But don't give up. Be that firebrand. I see it in you. I know who you are. You may not know who you are. I know who you are. I can sense it when I pray for you. We have firebrands for Christ in this place. We have ones that are going to change and are changing. Salt and light, changing culture. Because we only live one life. The Bible says that you'll only live one life, and after that, the judgment, reincarnation is not true. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Paul is speaking to the church or writing to the church at Philippi. Listen to his words. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, yes, even the difficult ones, by prayer, by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God. Talk about anxiety. It can't face the peace of God. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The antidote for worry that we see in this scripture is prayer and gratitude. We think, we, we, we focus on those things we don't have. We say, I don't have this. If I could only have this bank account, if I could only have this person on my arm, if I could only have this team, if I could only have this, this, this that I don't have, and our focus gets on the wrong things. That's how we live in this world too often, is that our focus is on the temporal. Jesus is saying on the Sermon on the Mount, get your focus on the kingdom. Invest in what is eternal. Consider what matters most. Stand to your feet, if you will. The peace of God comes when we implicitly trust Him. want to know God in ways you don't know him now, step out in faith. Give of your time into the kingdom. Go to the next level in that. Step forward in your resources being invested in what is eternal.